When we were fixing up the pool... Stop! They said it hadn't been used in 15 years. Maybe the your mouth shut. Marka. My kids have seen things, and I'm worried something is happening to my husband. January is often a graveyard shift for movies, a time when studios release films they have no confidence in. Yet in the cinematic wasteland, some horror films have consistently found fertile ground. The trend has given rise to many high-concept thrillers that began their years with a bang. The previous year's horror comedy Megan set a high bar, and it was with a mix of skepticism and hope that I approached Blumhouse's latest offering Night Swim, directed and written by Bryce McGuire. The film's quirky premise of an evil swimming pool suggested potential for at least a few laughs if not outright terror. Unfortunately, it proves to be a disappointing addition to the genre, merely paddling in the shallow end of creativity. The movie features Wyatt Russell and Kerry Condon playing Ray and Eve Waller, who, along with their two children, Elliot and Izzy, move to a suburban home seeking a new start. Ray, a former Major League Baseball player, is grappling with multiple sclerosis, a condition that ended his career but brought him closer to his family, while Eve, a school administrator and former Navy brat, is determined to establish a safe and normal life amidst the challenging circumstances. However, their idyllic family existence soon becomes disrupted by eerie experiences around their new in-ground pool, where each family member encounters mysterious and sometimes menacing visions. Despite the promising setup and mostly solid performances from the leads, Maguire's adaptation, an evolution of the short film he originally developed with Rod Blackhurst in 2014, is disappointing. <laughs> the narrative is confusing and disjointed, lacking the clarity and precision needed to build suspense or deliver effective scares. Promising ideas are introduced but remain undeveloped, leaving me yearning for a more cohesive and engaging story. The film's progression actually gives the impression of it being made up on the fly, and the lack of coherent storytelling or frights results in a horror that fails to scare you. The opening scene does its best to set a suspenseful tone. Set in 1992, we meet young Rebecca Summers, who spots a toy boat in the pool from her bedroom window. Eager to retrieve it for her ailing brother Tommy, Rebecca ventures out with a pool net. However, a mysterious force pulls her in, with only her slipper resurfacing. The scene, like many that follow, maximizes tension through meticulous cinematography, editing, and a haunting soundtrack, yet it lands in the realm of mildly spooky, stopping short of truly terrifying. As we fast forward to the present day, we're introduced to the Waller family. Ray's career has been curtailed by a degenerative illness, and the family is in search of a new home, becoming intrigued by the house that once belonged to the Summers family, with its now closed pool. A disturbing incident occurs when Ray is pulled into the water while trying to retrieve a baseball, necessitating a rescue and a trip to the hospital. But convinced that water immersion therapy could aid his condition, he persuades Eve that they should move in. For me, it really would have been nice to see Ray at an actual baseball game prior to his condition. But all we get is the same shot of him superimposed on an overexposed CGI field throughout the film that looked lazy. The family soon settles into their new home, with the children also adjusting to a new school. Izzy finds a budding romance with a member of the swim team named Ronan, but her brother struggles to fit in, unable to escape the shadow of his father and sister's natural talents as athletes. The Wallers eventually decide to clean and reopen the pool, but another ominous sign appears when something inside the drain cuts Ray's hand. They soon learn from a maintenance crew that the water is actually sourced from a nearby spring, and as the Wallers begin to use the pool, Ray reports feeling better from his therapy sessions. However, a series of unnerving events start to unfold. While swimming alone that evening, Eve experiences a hallucination of Ray watching her from above the water, only to find him absent upon resurfacing. The family cat cider then mysteriously disappears after a tense encounter with something in the pool, prompting the Wallers to install a pool cover. What's odd about this moment is that it sensed something strange about the water earlier and ran away, so to see it come back to the pool and die felt really contrived. When Elliot decides to use the pool alone, he also encounters a strange phenomenon where coins are thrown in for him to collect. Initially suspecting his sister Izzy, he's surprised to find no one around when he pops up. 
But it's not long till the quiet is disrupted by the ghostly voice of Rebecca calling out for her mother. Seemingly friendly, she offers Elliot a toy, but as he reaches for it, a terrifying hand of a woman grabs his arm instead. And although Elliot manages to escape, his father dismissively attributes it to his overactive imagination. At the same time, Ray's health begins to miraculously improve, with his illness appearing to go into remission. When he joins Elliot at a baseball practice, he experiences a moment of weakness, but quickly recovers when thinking of the pool. Demonstrating his renewed strength, he hits a baseball with such force that it shatters a light, earning cheers from everyone around them. The plot thickens when Izzy invites her crush over to the pool while her parents are away. Their game of Marco Polo takes a sinister turn when she's unable to locate Ronan or hear the music they were playing. A growling voice then startles her before a grotesque bloated man pulls her underwater. She resurfaces quickly to find a bewildered Ronin, who leaves her after a brief kiss, unaware of Izzy's terrifying experience. While the family does seem close, there's a jarring moment where Izzy threatens to kill her brother's fish if he told their parents about her boyfriend sneaking into the home while they were away. It was just uncharacteristic of the older sister we've been presented with up until that point. Still, Elliot later confides in Izzy that he too has witnessed something frightening in the pool, but they choose not to tell their parents. To help them settle in, Ray and Eve host a neighborhood pool party, where Eve actually discovers the unsettling truth about Rebecca's death in the pool from the realtor, which is why the previous homeowners avoided the water. With everything that's happened to the family in the pool, it just seemed odd for them to have a pool party in what is simply another plot contrivance to progress the story at the sacrifice of character. More on sacrifices later. With that said, as Ray participates in a game of chicken with the coach's son Ty, a misty grey cloud emerges from the drain and enters his mouth, causing Ray to pull himself and Ty into the deep end. Witnessing the struggle, Elliot rushes to Eve as Ty's father dives in to rescue his son, while Ray is pulled out of the water, seemingly unconscious. Luckily, while the other family chooses not to press charges, naturally, Eve, Izzy and Elliot become increasingly convinced that the pool is haunted. On the other hand, Ray is preoccupied with his physical improvements, seemingly oblivious to the malevolence. When Eve finally puts her foot down and tries to get the family away, Ray has an episode resembling water withdrawals and begins choking the further they got away from the home, forcing them to return. Eve's growing concern leads her to delve into the history of their home, and the research uncovers a pattern of unexplained disappearances of previous residents. And determined to uncover the truth, she tracks down Kay Summers, mother of Rebecca and Tommy, Kay, now afflicted with an illness similar to Tommy's past condition, reluctantly reveals a harrowing truth. The pool's water, sourced from an ancient well, is believed to grant wishes, but at a terrible cost. This revelation is underscored when Kay discloses that a wish for Tommy's health to improve resulted in Rebecca's sacrifice to the malevolent entity in the pool. Not only that, but her mother was complicit in the sacrifice and had no regrets. Here the film presents an intriguing yet underexploited concept akin to a Tales from the Crypt morality story, suggesting that the pool can fulfill desires in exchange for sacrifices. The premise begins to hint that the career-driven Ray might actually trade a family member's life for his health. However, this moral quandary is rendered moot as Ray becomes possessed, stripping him of any agency and the ability to make conscious choices. It also raised more questions than it answered, with the logic behind the pool's demand for a human sacrifice murky, especially given the inexplicable targeting of the family's pet cat. The film's inability to create a distinction between the pool and the water itself is also a critical, if not structural and linguistic misstep, with the family often referring to the supernatural force as the pool, rather than the water, before switching randomly between acts. Another indication that the director was simply making it all up on the spot, Elliot, hearing what he believed to be their missing cat, ventures near the pool and a ghost causes him to fall in before the pool cover ominously begins to close. Inside the house, another harrowing scene unfolds as Ray attacks Izzy. In a desperate bid to save her boy, Eve bravely jumps into the pool, where the spirits of the previous victims attempt to drag them under. Luckily, the spirit of Rebecca intervenes to help Eve, guiding her to safety, while Izzy manages to subdue her father by beating him with his baseball bat. The mother and daughter urge Ray to fight back, causing him to expel the black water, signifying the entity's release, while Elliot also regains consciousness. However, the entity's relentless pursuit of a sacrifice becomes evident as it begins to possess Elliot. And so, in a selfless act, Ray sacrifices himself by walking into the pool, allowing the entity to take him instead. Following the disappearance of Ray, the family decides to stay in the house to prevent others from encountering the entity, resolving to fill the pool with dirt and bury the malevolent force. Night Swim grapples with blending visceral fears with metaphysical dread. 
On the surface, it does an okay job of exploiting the innate terror associated with water. Maguire captures the eerie solitude of being alone in a pool and the primal fear of drowning, grounded in the everyday experience of distorted perceptions underwater or the fleeting panic of losing touch with the pool's bottom. However, it stumbles with poor dialogue and plot progression as more of the supernatural elements are revealed. The enigmatic nature of the film's watery antagonists become diluted the more we see of them and their motives remain a mystery. While we understand the water wants a sacrifice, it's hard to figure out why the ghosts are acting on its behalf. This also raised several unanswered questions like why Rebecca's spirit was helpful, with the disparity leading to confusion about their intentions and actions. The entity's manifestation is also erratic. Although primarily associated with the spring water in the pool, later its influence extends beyond the pool to a glass of water in the house. For me, this undermined the film's internal logic, making me wonder why the entity didn't just possess the family through other water sources in the home when its influence was now beyond the pool. And by the climactic scene, the film struggles to evoke a genuine sense of terror. As a result, Night Swim often feels like it's treading water, submerging the audience in monotony rather than fear. Primarily a ghost story, it showcases some effectively creepy water-based scares, the most notable being a sinister game of Marco Polo featured in the film's trailer, yet the plot is muddled with a resolution that fails to resonate. The film shines when it focuses on creating an atmospheric, spooky ambience. However, as soon as it begins to explain everything, the story, much like the water being drained from the pool, spirals away and begins to fall apart. Despite these narrative shortcomings, utilizing a variety of lenses and angles, the director elevates the mundane setting of a pool into something expansive and menacing. A common symbol of leisure and recreation, the water is reimagined as a site brimming with perilous possibilities, and with a more streamlined script, Night Swim had the potential to truly plunge into the depths of horror. Editor Jeff McAvoy, known for his work on Megan, also skillfully weaves together key scenes, instilling a sense of unease and unpredictability, while cinematographer Charlie Saroff, drawing inspiration from Bill Butler's work on Jaws, employs inventive framing to hint at the lurking dangers beneath the water's surface. Despite these technical strengths, Night Swim falls short in fulfilling its horror premise, leaning towards a dark drama rather than the fright-filled experience its marketing suggested. While shaky for the first act due to the writing, Kerry Condon delivers a decent performance, bringing depth and intensity to her role. Her chemistry with Wyatt Russell and the kids is palpable. However, the plot and dialogue fails to capitalize on these performances. It's evident that Bryce McGuire drew elements from various horror classics, including The Shining, It, Lights Out, and Poltergeist, but he failed to create a cohesive or original story. The film borrows the familiar trope of a malevolent spirit targeting children, without adding anything new to the genre. While Night Swim does achieve moments of creepiness through clever camera work and atmospheric tension, it fails to fully capitalize on its premise, resulting in a movie that is often visually intriguing, but narratively unsatisfying, and especially not that scary. Ultimately, Night Swim feels like an overextended swim in deep waters, leaving the audience as fatigued and waterlogged as a swimmer who's lingered too long beneath the surface. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Marco. Hello. <laughs>